Hi, I'm James Lawler, and I'm the founder of Climate Now, which is climatenow.com. Climate Now is a resource featuring video content and podcast content that delves into key topics in climate science and energy science. We feature experts across academia and industry, getting below the headlines and really explaining how these topics work, um, the science behind uh, you know the predictions that we see in the world about climate and about energy. We've spoken to Roger Ains before, and uh, Roger is the Energy Program Chief Scientist at eProgram, which conducts government and private sector research in clean energy technology. Roger is also the leader of the Carbon Initiative at Lawrence Livermore National Lab, which aims to understand, develop, and implement technologies for the removal of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, which we're going to discuss today. Uh, the Lawrence Livermore National Lab and the uh, Livermore Lab Foundation are supporters of Climate Now. Um, Roger, it's great to talk to you again. Good to see you, James. Thank you. Um, so, Roger, I'd love to uh, start just by, um, so if, I wonder if you could set the stage with some background on the report Getting to Neutral that you spearheaded from LLNL, Lawrence Livermore National Lab. Could you introduce this report? What is the report about and how did it come about? Well, when we look at the overall climate approaches that it's going to take to get to one and a half degrees C, the, the future that we've all agreed is the, the one we'd like to have, it's clear that just reducing our emissions isn't going to be enough. Even after we have a fully electric world, we've gotten rid of fossil fuels, there's still going to be some continued emissions. But more than that, there's going to be all the carbon dioxide we already put in the atmosphere, which we know is already too much. And so we wrote a report looking at what would California like to do? What are the options for California to reach zero, to, to actually reach net zero by 2045? And the options question is, is one of, there, there's no uh, immediate list of things that you absolutely have to do. There's a lot of different things you could do to remove carbon dioxide in the atmosphere to make up for what we've already emitted and the small amount that we will continue to emit in the future. Great, and so what I'd love to do in this conversation is walk through the logic of that report, starting with the problem that we need to address, following that with the options for solving that problem. So what, um, what pathways did you identify for decarbonization and, and removing carbon from, from the atmosphere? And then thirdly, what is there that sort of the general public can do to sort of speed us along this path and, and accelerate this, this, this forward progress? So let's start with the problem. Um, we have dramatically increased the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere since the dawn of the Industrial Revolution, going from something like 280 parts per million to about 415 parts per million, which is a dramatic increase, most of that coming since the 1960s. Um, and we know from historical data, looking at ice core data, looking at sediment core data, that the temperature fluctuation we're seeing and the, the concentration of CO2 that we're seeing is really unprecedented in the, in the last million years, probably more. Um, so we've established clearly that, you know, that there's a causal connection between anthropogenic or human-based carbon, carbon dioxide emissions and the temperature and the, the warming that we're seeing. Um, and so I'm, I'm wondering if you could describe what is the current you know, CO2 emissions trajectory look like um, today? And how far can we get through emissions reduction? The good news is that our climb of emissions, the rise is <clears throat> not accelerating in the way that we thought it would. The bad news is that it's still rising. And so we need to certainly stop those emissions. And the models of global climate tell us that we need to get those emissions down to the minimum we can make in perhaps 20 years. There's a lot of ambiguity about exactly how fast you do that and how steep a cliff you fall off in order to do that. But part of that issue is that you can balance that with removals from the atmosphere at a later date. Mm -hmm. 
before we move to the removal piece of this, I wonder if we could spend just like a little, just a little bit more time on the top three or four ways in which, you know, California and the world can reduce emissions. We've all focused on electricity because for a long time in this country, we used coal to make our electricity and that's a, a nasty uh, kind of insult to the climate, a lot of emissions of CO2. In California, that problem is, is essentially solved. It's no longer legal to purchase electricity, uh, to enter into new contracts for electricity that come from coal-fired power, and the old contracts are expiring and are nearly gone. So coal-fired power is no longer a part of California's future. That's good news. And we see solar and wind rising rapidly. So electricity is close to being solved. There's still issues associated with exactly how many solar panels we need to build and how much uh, natural gas or other sources of power remain in the mix as very small parts of the, the, the uh, solution. But basically, I regard those as subjects of, of engineering or policy and not really science anymore. We know how to have a net zero electric future, and we can do it today. The next thing, and the thing that's really difficult for California is transportation. Our emissions from our cars and trucks are now the largest portion of our emissions in California, and they're rising, unlike electricity that's declining steadily. So we need to understand how to get that under control. Um, electric vehicles are a terrific solution, but they're also kind of a slow solution. The average lifetime of a car in California is 20 years. And so unless you're gonna have the state go up and buy up all the old internal combustion in engines, then we're gonna have in internal combustion around for a while, no matter how aggressive we are. So that's a problem. And that's a thing that we have to deal with. And that also leads to things like emissions from refineries. All of the gasoline used in California is refined in California and those refineries emit a significant amount of carbon dioxide. So that's a big part of the industrial emissions that we also have to do. And those two are linked. We can't get away from the fact that refineries feed cars and cars are gonna be around for a while. After that, we get down into the small stuff, things that are important, things like concrete. We're gonna continue using concrete. We have to understand how to control those emissions without offshoring them, which means without basically closing our cement plants and, and encouraging them to be built overseas, which might be not be anywhere near as clean as ours. So these are the kinds of choices that we're facing in California. The last thing that is probably the thorniest in California is agriculture. There's a lot of emissions from agriculture. And the one that I like to highlight there is fertilizer. When we spread fertilizer, nitrate on fields, some of it turns into nitrous oxide. And that is one of the worst greenhouse gases you can ever see. And the only option we have today for not having that happen is to stop fertilizing, but fertilizer is what feeds the world. So these are the kinds of difficult questions we're facing, but those are the big categories for what it takes to get close to zero. Mm -hmm. And Roger, I'd love to ask you about one that that you didn't mention, and I, and I wonder how significant this is, because I've been reading more about this lately, and that's energy efficiency as a lever for decarbonization. Um, I read something I, I read something from the Rocky Mountain Institute RMI just the other day. And this is a fascinating, fascinating quote, I thought. Um, the quote is, few policymakers realize that saved energy is already the world's largest source of energy services, larger than oil. So for, for example, from 1990 to 2016, reductions in global energy intensity saved more energy in 2016 than the oil burned in 2016. So, so this idea that you know energy efficiency is this potentially, you know, is a is this has been a significant resource and potentially remains a significant untapped resource for you know reducing um, energy demand, which would in turn potentially you know re reduce the amount of carbon we emit. But I, how does that figure into the calculus for? tonnage of CO2 that we may have to remove in the future. Yeah, I like that description because basically as each of these sectors expands, efficiency is a thing that um, reduces the entire sector. I mean, let's look at cars. We know that it's perfectly reasonable to have the average efficiency of cars on our uh, streets be twice as good as it is today. That's half as much carbon emissions. And so 
taking that option is, is really important and just continuing to shave the overall energy demand while not decreasing the energy services that we ask for. We're not saying don't have a car, we're saying have a more efficient car. Right, and I think it's 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 really fascinating, sort of what the um, how much we've been able to do almost without realizing it. Um, and the the and Putin's war in the Ukraine is 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 casting a light on this now. We we also faced a similar crisis in the '70s, didn't we, with the with the energy shocks that happened then, and which really altered the trajectory of energy use globally due to innovations and efficiency and and the, and the beginnings of sort of the rollout of renewables and one wonders if if what we're seeing um uh you know in in the ukraine today might have a similar accelerating effect on on what's happening worldwide I, again we're we're we're, we're on a tangent a bit but Ra i'm curious roger if you have any thoughts there and then we'll go back to uh negative emissions <laughs> I, I think crisis is an important driver of change and at the time of those 70s shocks, we in California decided that we needed to be more energy efficient. And every year since then, we have. The, the state's building codes, the state's overall policies have increased efficiency, and we use less efficiency per person, less efficiency per unit of gross domestic product. Every year, we've made it better. It works. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Um, so I'd love to turn now to sort of the other option. So we really have two options to combat the problem. One is reduce emissions, and we've talked a bit about that. And the second is capture the carbon and store it away permanently out of the atmosphere where it can't cause warming. Um, so on this, this is the subject of the getting to neutral report um, that, that you put together, you described earlier. Um, talk about this issue of um, let's let's talk about the three pillars that you identify in the report for carbon capture and and storage. What are sort of the three large categories um, that you outline? Well, the first is is what we commonly call natural solutions, trees and soil. And these are incredibly important because they've been removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere forever. And they do a great job of it while providing other valuable services like beautiful forests. Um, but in California, that's not a huge option for us because for better or worse, I think for better, we never deforested California. It's not like Tennessee where, where the forests were all cut down and now they're growing back. That we, we don't have that circumstance in California. So we have a relatively limited opportunity to regrow forests that we cut down. Now, the big opportunity for us here is to stop burning down our forests. Um, uh, two years ago in that bad year, we uh, the forest fires in California emitted more carbon dioxide than all of California's industry. Hmm. Huge source of carbon dioxide. So the challenge for us is to stop our natural lands from losing carbon, and then hopefully turn the lever to the point where they're actually absorbing it again, like we would like them to be. And we think that can be an important, and it's also a relatively inexpensive way that has a lot of side benefits, all things that we like. So that's always the first choice in negative emissions is to increase, improve, encourage natural solutions. And then let's let's go to the third pillar next, which is the sort of the, the full technology one. Is if the problem is that there's too much CO2 in the air, then can we just build machines to take it out? And the answer has been yes, people are doing that. There are now several companies around the world that are building facilities at a relatively small scale today, but increasing dramatically in the next few years to remove carbon dioxide from the air. And we call this direct air capture. And that option is a, a very straightforward one. It's like, we'll build the machines, they'll clean up the air. And the issue with that today is that it's still expensive, hopefully going to get less expensive, and it uses a lot of energy. And that's probably actually the biggest issue is that while we're doing this energy transition, we also have to add now the energy that it's gonna to take to clean up the atmosphere with these machines. So we have to consider that. And that leads to our, our middle pillar which is, can we combine those two things? Can we take the work that nature is already doing? Can we take the work that the sun is, is being absorbed by plants, they're turning it into uh, 
chlorophyll and into biomass, what we call the, the wood and the tr leaves and everything that are left over, and storing energy there, storing that solar energy, and carbon. The important thing to recognize about a, a chunk of wood is it's half carbon by weight. It's an amazing source of carbon that was in the atmosphere recently. And now the trick is, can we keep it from going back into the atmosphere? And by that means, use that tree as a way to remove carbon from the atmosphere. And in, in California, we're not talking about going and cutting down trees for that purpose, but we're already cutting down a lot of wood, small material in the forest to reduce the hazard of fires. So the question is, instead of just burning that as we do today, can we take that material and somehow store that carbon, probably underground, permanently? And it turns out that there's a lot of other carbon like that. There's forest waste, as I mentioned, there's agricultural waste. Do you know that we produce a million tons of almond shells in California a year? And what happens to them? It ends up back in the air. Um, million tons. I like my almonds, but it always amazes me, that number. <laughs> um, and finally, there's just trash. Um, a, a lot of trash, about 75% of trash is actually organic waste. It's paper, it's food, unfortunately, and uh, things that, that were in the atmosphere recently. So all of those are sources where we can take them and do what we call biomass conversion. And that's probably the biggest option for California is to stop letting this trash, this waste material, go back into the atmosphere and get it permanently out of the atmosphere, which probably means deep underground. Mm -hmm. So before we move to the sequestration part of this, that is the storage of the of the carbon deep underground, I'd love to just drill a little bit deeper, if you will pardon the metaphor, into the three uh, <laughs> into into the, those three pillars. Um, starting with the first that you mentioned, so the natural solutions, natural you know carbon sinks, and the opportunity for that that exists in California. You mentioned that it's limited. Um, what what are those opportunities in California today? Where, where is their potential and, and I guess how? So, because the one of the ones you mentioned was stopping the, you know, the forest from burning in the first place. That seems like a very tall order, but how might we, we improve these natural carbon sinks? Well, there's a, a, a basically a whole science of forest management. And then it generates a category called improved forest management. <laughs> and basically the idea is to use our forests better to, to, encourage the growth of large trees. It turns out that a redwood tree in, grabs more and more carbon every year of its life forever. So uh -huh. we want bigger trees. <laughs> Improved forest management means bigger trees. And so things like that are actually um, great ways to improve the efficiency of the existing forests. Something that we're concerned about in California is soil carbon. Now, California's soils have never had the kind of carbon that let's say Iowa's do, where you have deep, very rich soils that grow the corn for the world. Um, our soils are not so carbon rich, they grow different crops, but we can still increase the amount of carbon in them with good soil management. Um, and a, a very important one for us is an area called the Delta around the, the uh, San Francisco region. Between San Francisco and Sacramento, there's an area where the rivers have come together. And in the past, this was all a, a sea of reeds, and it was basically a peat soil. So it's a carbon-rich soil. That turns out to be a magical place to grow things like asparagus. Most of the country's asparagus has grown about 10 miles from my house. But in the course of growing that asparagus, those carbon-rich soils evaporate. Basically, that carbon turns into CO2, the soil starts declining. And there are places out there where these farms that formerly were at sea level are now 20 feet below sea level because the soil has disappeared into the air. Hmm. So, you know, reversing that kind of trend, super important. There's a great opportunity there to have strong farms and to grow the crops that we want to have. And we need to work out how to do that. Mm -hmm. And so moving to um, the second path, uh, which would be, let's say, the heavy technological path, the direct air capture path, one of the, the questions that, that comes up in my mind around that is, you know, these solutions, let's set, a, let's set the cost aside for a moment. These solutions require, as you mentioned, a lot of energy to work. Um, 
Now, does it make, why would we not simply use that energy? Presumably it's, you know, we're talking about solar generation or, or wind generation or something of that nature. Why wouldn't we simply use that energy to decarbonize the electricity grid as opposed to use it to, to pull carbon out of the air? Wouldn't that be more efficient in terms of just, if we have a certain amount of energy, why not use it to stop a ton of CO2 being emitted rather than allow the ton to be emitted and then have to capture it again. You absolutely should. There's no question that there, there's no argument that you shouldn't do that. If you have a, a, a dollop of clean energy that should first be used to replace dirty energy. And the, the reason that we're looking at direct air capture today is because the scale that's required is, is large. And so to learn how to do it, to build, to learn how to build that equipment and to, to reduce the cost is going to take practice. It's going to take implementation of that. And for the moment, we have to do those two things in parallel. It's, it's rather like um, assuming that that's the defense in, let's say, a soccer game. Uh, it, it, yes, you're, you're very dependent on the stars of the soccer game or a wind and solar here to go out and score points and, and have offense, but you're not going to pull the goalie either. You still need defense. You still need, and you hope you'll, you'll, you might not need it, but let's face it, you do occasionally. So that's kind of the role that that, that plays is in the future, we know we're going to need it. So we need to make sure that it's there when, when we do. Got it. So setting it setting it on its learning curve and sort of downward price trajectory, ideally sooner rather than later. Okay. Um, so the the biomass is the third option, and cultivating biomass. The report does a really uh, is is presents the amount of waste and amount of potential biomass across California in a very helpful way, showing these nice bar graphs in different different regions and what the composition of the bio the biomass might be. Um, how far along are we on the trajectory towards, uh, on the path of being able to use the potential biomass that exists for energy production? Like, how, you know, what, could you describe where are we today on that trajectory in California? First, there's a lot of interest in implementing this because the regulatory methods in California support things that remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. So there's, there's, Basically, there's money on the table to do these things. Mm -hmm. But I want to point out that this is something we've been doing in California for many years. Every sewage plant in California has a system to recover methane from it, which would be otherwise a nasty greenhouse gas, recover that and make energy out of it. And, and most of it's being used to make electricity today, but increasingly that's being used to make transportation fuels. And now those plants are looking at also capturing the carbon dioxide that's made as part of that. So this is something that we have experience with. We have a lot of engineers who already know how to do it. And this is, we need to, need to grow in more of those and take in more of those kinds of trash, sewage being the first one we started with. Hmm. And are there, what are some of the challenges around, um, uh, around sort of the the collection and harnessing of this resource. I mean, it's obviously a very plentiful resource. There's a ton of trash. There's a ton of forest waste, agricultural waste. But it seems like that the, the one of the hard parts would be just gathering it and getting it to a place where it can be used. Is that how, how big of a problem is that today, or challenge is that? And where are we solving it? Well, we love talking about this forest waste problem that's being generated by our attempts to control forest fires. But in fact, the other two categories are the ones that are getting the first attention because they're already being collected. Trash, you already pay someone to pick up your trash from your door, Let's take it to a centralized facility. And so now that can feed into, if you, if you build a conversion facility there to capture that carbon and say, make fuel out of it. So there is a a large plant just coming online now that uses California trash and is, is using it to make jet fuel. So that is already happening because it's already being collected. Mm -hmm. Same with agricultural waste. Much of that waste is collected. So for instance, the almond shells are collected at a site that shells the almonds. And so it's already there and can be um, you know localized. So those two are getting a lot of attention to begin with. The other issue of collecting from the forest is, is frankly more difficult. Yeah, yeah. 
So let's turn to, to sequestration. I know we only have a few minutes left, but um, the, the sequestration part, part of this is very interesting um, because of how well suited California is you know, for that purpose. Can, can you talk about that, Roger? The issue is how do we keep this carbon dioxide out of the air permanently? It's like five or 10 years won't do us any good. We have to keep it permanent. And let's just use the word permanent. Yeah. Um, and <laughs> the uh, best way that we found to do that, the highest volume way is to stick it back where it came from, to put it deep underground, a mile or more underground, where you typically find oil and gas today in the same kinds of rocks that held that oil and gas for millions of years. You Sometimes oil and gas comes out by itself, but basically you have to work really hard to get it out. And so if we put that carbon dioxide back underground in places like that, it will also stay there permanently. The good news in California is one of the reasons we have all the oil and gas that we've ever had is that we have the right rocks for that. And now we also have the right people. We have the experience. We have the infrastructure to do this job. And so we're very well suited to be able to do this and not only to get the carbon out of the air permanently, but also to create a transition for jobs that is going to be good, particularly for the Central Valley of California. Mm-hmm. And one of the things that people, you know, that I think some folks find surprising is when when CO2 is put a mile deep, it's not, it doesn't remain in gaseous form. We're talking about a substance that has the same viscosity or similar viscosity and, and sort of density as, as oil does at that. Am I, am I right about that? Right. It, it turns into a liquid. Basically, you press on it hard enough and it turns into a liquid and it will stay a liquid deep underground. Right. Um, what sorts of things can the general public do today to kind of accelerate us toward, you know, net zero in California? What is there that, that folks can, can do? Well, there's two things that I would highlight. The first is to support legislators and companies and filmmakers who are encouraging net zero. This is very important. There are, there are bad actors and there are good actors and the public can align behind the good actors. That's, that's really simple. Make it clear that you appreciate what they're doing and that you buy their products or vote for them or watch their movies. Um, and then, you know, the second is to look at your own individual choices that you make. And, you know, I bought this house eight years ago. At that point, I didn't think about putting in an electric water heater. I would today. I regret that. I have a brand new, really nice gas water heater sitting back there. I wish it was electric (laughs) because then as in the near future, our grid will be completely um, carbon-free and I could have carbon-free water heating, which I don't have today. So thinking about those choices, um, stovetops, induction stovetops today are just as good as gas stovetops. And they can, in fact, in many ways, even better. So making choices like that. And of course, at the time that you're able to buy an electric car, please think about that because that's going to be the biggest transition for California and the hardest one that we're all going to have to dig in a little bit to make that happen. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Roger. 